Okay, so this is the third video lecture on the chapter on social psychology. And I want to pick up where we left off, specifically talking about cognitive dissonance. That is a fun dinner party phrase. Cognitive dissonance, so cognitive meaning thinking, and it's the idea that we can hold thoughts that cause us to stress when they are dissonant, when they are in opposition. And sometimes we're forced to do things. So, so cognitive dissonance is I have differing ideas and they're in opposition and I have to figure out how to reconcile that I really don't like to go to Walmart and here I am at Walmart. So I have to think, so if I can't change the way I act, and sometimes I can change my behavior so that all my ideas, all my thoughts are in order, all, are all, are all um, in line, right, are all in sync. But if I can't change the way that I act, then I will change the way that I think, right? I'll change my cognition. Um, and we, we do this a lot when we change our opinion about things or we justify why we're doing certain things in certain settings because this is a, this creates a psychic tension to hold opposing ideals. So I feel, for, for instance, I have not gone to Walmart for a very long time. I can give you a whole lecture. I, remember, I think I was just talking about that as to why I don't go to Walmart, but occasionally I have no choice. And so I have to create, in my mind, I have to create a belief or a cognition, an idea that makes that okay, so that I, so I don't experience psychic distress. There's some really intriguing experiments, that, classic experiments that have been done to test cognitive dissonance. Um, probably the most, uh, the one that I'm the most familiar with is what's illustrated right here in this box. And so they, uh, they wanted to see how people would rate an activity and one group a boring activity. So boring is one of the cognitions. This is really a boring game. One group was given $20 to play the game. One group was given $1 to play this very boring game. And then at the end of the experiment, they ask who found the boring game the most boring. And while you might think it was the group that paid, that, um, was given, oh my gosh, see, I just had to pre-record this lecture twice. While you might think that it was the group that was given $1, in fact, it was the group that get $20. So you give two groups, right? You give the $1 group and the $20 group, and the group that actually gets the most money is the one that's going to say that's the most unpleasant, right? Because they have to, these two things have to, the group, it's the, in, the intrigue, the interest is really around the $1 group. So like, how could this group that only paid, was given $1, how could they possibly find this not boring? Well, they had to justify in their mind why they were doing something unpleasant for only a dollar. Well, the way they justified it is it wasn't so unpleasant, right? It wasn't that bad. So sometimes we have to create these, um, tell ourselves, um, tell ourselves different uh, interpretations of the events. Um, another one um, has ex is an experiment where these groups were given this, like they had to eat like a bug, or I think, it, I think in the textbook talked about a, a chunky grasshopper, a yucky grasshopper. And one group was asked to, uh, to eat it by a nice researcher that sort of, you know, was, was pleasant. And then the other group was asked to eat this yucky grasshopper by somebody who was unpleasant, who was a jerk. And, and sure enough, the group where the person was nice, they said that it was more unpleasant than the group where the person was not nice because they had to explain to themselves, why would I do this unpleasant thing for this unpleasant person? Well, because the unpleasant thing wasn't so unpleasant. The, the, the gross grasshopper wasn't, wasn't really that gross, you know, so I didn't really mind doing it, even though the group who had the nice person ask them found it to be really gross. Okay. Okay. So let's move on and talk about something, uh, something fun right? Love and attraction. So this is a topic that when I get to teach my marriage and family class, I have a whole chapter and we can talk about love and attraction. Um, the assessment or the task that goes along or one of the tasks that goes with this chapter or with this video is a, is a brief assessment that invites you to 
uh, to take to answer a couple questions to measure your love language. Your textbook does not talk about love language, or I didn't notice it, right? Maybe I haven't looked at this edition, but I don't believe your textbook talks about love language. Your textbook talks about the triangle theory of love, which the triangle theory suggests that all relationships are made up of these three components. And that might be a quiz question, what are the three components according to triangle theory? And those components are commitment, Ooh, fooey. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot. Um, commitment, intimacy, and passion. Well, that's not right. And so, yes, it is. Commitment, intimacy, and passion. Intimacy meaning self-disclosure, uh, making yourself vulnerable to another person. Passion is just what it sounds like. It was sort of that lust or that attraction. And then commitment is I am loyal to this relationship or this person is important and I will respond to them. The triangle theory of love says that all, theory, that all relationships are made up of these three pieces. So like friendship, friendship might be intimacy. And again, we're not talking sexual intimacy, that falls under passion. But friend, a friendship might be a lot of self-disclosure and commitment. So I am reliably standing by my friend's side. Or you have something called empty love, and empty love may only be commitment. You stay in a relationship because you are committed to that relationship. You don't, you don't have any passion anymore. You don't have any romance. You don't really talk about anything, but you are committed to that relationship. Or the early stage, or maybe even a friends with benefits, right? A friends with benefits might have some passion, but maybe a little intimacy, but doesn't have any commitment. But the idea from that theoretical model is that all relationships are some sort of combination of these things, right? Or a therapist might just be intimacy, but no commitment, no passion. The assessment, the love language um, activity that I've given you is based on another idea of what love is. And it's the, the idea is that we all love um, in our own language. We, and there are five languages. There is a touch, which is touch, holding hands, sex, that kind of thing. Acts of service, which is doing things for people, scraping their windshield, bringing them coffee, doing their laundry. Uh, gifts, which is any sort of token that you, that you give to someone. It can be like a text message or a card or diamonds, but it's something, it's a thing. It's showing that they think about you through things. Um, words of affirmation. The women, a lot of women are words of affirmation, and that is simply, I love you, you are neat, you are beautiful, you have great ideas, they, where they affirm you through words. Um, and then, what did I talk about? Okay, good touch, uh, affirmation gives time together, which is simply being in the same space with someone. And did I say them all? Acts of service? Did I say acts of service? Yes, yeah, so acts of service, time together, simply be in the same space touch, words of affirmation, and my goodness, I can't believe it. Touch, words of affirmation, gifts, of, uh, gifts, acts of service, and time together. I think I got them all. Okay. Anyway, so that, um, that assessment invites you to ask, uh, to take a few questions, to answer a few questions, and to see what your love language is. And the idea behind these love languages is that a lot of the conflict that couples may get into is because they, they believe they're loving their partner, but their partner doesn't feel loved. Or maybe you don't feel loved by your partner, but your partner thinks that they're loving you, and it's because we're communicating in different languages. So that's just a really useful, it's a useful model. I, think, oh, I, feel, I hope I didn't forget any. Um, so another question or another idea that's sort of uh, presented here, and it's a fun one for me to talk about, is the notion, actually I'm going to stop this video right now, and when I come back I want to talk more about some of the, some of the ideas that are presented here.